Hi, welcome to the bathtub, where when you hear this music, and you see this whiteboard, and you see these words, pointless and meaningless, on the whiteboard, then you know you're ready for another episode of Pointless Adventures in Literature, which is our newest theme show here at the, at the bathtub. And uh, these, are, these are completely ran, rambling and useless anecdotes that I, of my literary career of, of really pretty much doing nothing, pretty much no, almost nothing at all. And sometimes the, the, uh, the anecdotes are going to be pointless. Sometimes they're going to be meaningless. Sometimes they'll be, be both pointless and meaningless. And you can always, but you can always, always expect these anecdotes to be pointless, meaningless, or both. And, 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 and if anything, if you get anything out of these whatsoever, then you, you, you've been looking at them in the wrong direction. So I want to start off with a, with a really long rhetorical question because you never get into pointless. Whenever a pointless discussion starts, it always starts with a rhetorical question. I have a glass of white wine because it's not really dark yet. So we're getting ready for Comet Neowise outside. Um, the rhetorical question is, what does this... My first book of stories, Dream of the Wolf, and the story of the Dream of the Wolf, which is the title story, and that's what I looked like back then. I looked absolutely ridiculous. And uh, Dream of the Wolf, what has that got to do with Roger Corman, the great schlock director and producer of hundreds of really ridiculous movies, which are, o which are almost always sort of fun, uh, who wrote this great book called How I Made 100 Movies in Hollywood, and never lost a dime. That's got to be the greatest title for a, a, a memoir of working in Hollywood I've ever read. And it's also a great book. What does what does me have to do with him? Have to do with the great American writer Richard Yates. You would think not the three of us would not even be in the same room. Richard Yates, particularly one of his best books called Liars in Love. I met Richard Yates. There's my first my. He signed it for me. He's one of his greatest stories, particularly about Hollywood, called uh, uh, Saying Goodbye to Sally. It's a long story at the end of this, one of my favorite uh, stories by Richard Yates. What has that got to do with the great Blake Bailey biography of Richard Yates, which came out in the 2000s sometime? And what could they possibly have to do with one another? And, I'm, and, and, uh, and again, here even more so, what could they possibly have to do with this thing called Wolfhound? That's a woman who somehow t takes off all her clothes and turns into a wolfhound, or vice versa, or turns a, from a wolfhound turns into a naked woman, who is Julie Cialani, Playmate of the Year from 2000 or something, 1999 or something. And how did that great cinema classic, and another great cinema classic, Shakedown, Shakedown, which has... Ron Perlman and, and, and Fred Dreyer's in this movie. Um, how did the, what do they all have to do with each other? And they have, they have only one thing to do with it, a rambling anecdote. So it starts off in 1999, 2000, 2001. I honestly don't remember. I'm not going to check because it's too pointless to find out. I was uh, going through a kind of difficult time in my life and, and uh, was, and was moving to London and or moving to a new place in London and so forth and so, and so on. And um, in the course of this, I got a call, an actual phone call, from a woman named Frances Dole. Most people don't know Frances Dole, but they should. She's kind of a legend in Hollywood. She worked for, for Roger Corman for, this is one of my favorite Corman movies, The Raven. He did a lot of really cheap, quick uh, uh, kind of rip-offs of Edgar Allan Poe. This is the funniest one. And... Um, Frances, Frances called me and said she was interested in showing me a script that they had about a guy who goes to Ireland and uh, they, he gets obsessed with wolves and she basically, in the course of the conversation, confessed to me that they had basically stolen my idea from Dream of the Wolf. My, the story of mine. The story of my Dream of the Wolf, it's one of my best stories. It's about a guy, he doesn't turn into a wolf, but he becomes obsessed with wolves, and he dreams about them all the time, and he, he finds in their, his dreams of the wolves more reality than in his kind of boring life. That's the basic premise of it. And there's lots of kind of strong imagery of this wolves, these wolves that I stole out of natural history books. Um, so uh, Francis said that they've got this script, and the script is kind of a mess. They didn't know what to do with it. 
But, you know, because they were kind of stealing the idea from me anyway, she thought, well, why don't you look at it? Maybe you'd like to work on it. And I said, Roger Corman, yes. Now, at the time, this is, you know, I grew up watching Roger Corman movies like Little Shop of Horrors and, and all of those old Edgar Allan Poe ripoffs and, you know, um, Panic in the Year Zero. I, I grew up watching, uh, watching Roger Corman movies. And he, to me, was this kind of cultural hero. I always thought he was the first independent Hollywood producer in many ways. And um, I just said, yeah, I'll do, I'll do whatever you want me to do. You can steal my stuff. I'll just, I'll do it. I want to do it. I work, work with you. I want to work with Roger Corman. So she sends me this script, and it was kind of, it didn't make much sense, but it was sort of obvious, slightly a ripoff of my story, but not entirely. And, you know, there's no way I could have sued them or, or had wanted to, really. But it was just about a guy who gets obsessed with wolves and, be, and transforms, or people in the town are transforming into wolves. I forget what the original script did. Anyway, they sent it to me, and um, I was quite excited about it. I went to Hollywood. I was going to L.A. anyway, because they don't fly anybody. Roger was cheap. He's super cheap. He, just, he, doesn't, he doesn't pay any money he doesn't have to. And he, he pays you money. He leaves you alone. He's a great person to work for. Everyone who worked for Corman sort of said the same thing. He gives you the money. He rips you off. And he leaves you alone. He doesn't drive you crazy like, you know, I would work for Hollywood uh, producers who would pay me twice as much. And they would just drive you fucking crazy. They never stopped annoying you with crazy ideas they had, you know, in the bathtub. So I go to, I'm in L.A. anyway, so I go by to see them. I meet Frances Doles, this lovely lady. She's, she's been involved working with Corman for, you know, a hundred years. She's produced and directed and written everything and worked all over Hollywood. And she says, I just always went back to work for Roger because it was fun. And I could see what she meant. So I go into, I go there, and she has an office. Her office looks like the cubicle. Her, she, this was, you know, 19, 2000, 2001. Looks like the cubicle of some like someone who just started in the business or someone who's like the temp secretary. She had it packed with boxes and books and 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 I went into the office and when I was looking around, I looked around and I saw um, a copy of my book, Dream of the Wolf, and at the same time I saw clippings of an interview I had done with Richard Yates, the great novelist Richard Yates, in nineteen ninety three. Okay, so this is 2001 or something, and, you know, it's 10 years after. And I said, well, it's really interesting that you had, you know, Richard Yates is my, my interview with him. And she said, oh, yeah, we've seen all this stuff around. And Richard had worked with Roger Corman at one time. I had no idea that Richard Yates had worked with Corman. So I go in, I meet, I meet Roger Corman. I have this really interesting, he's a really nice guy, just you know, all business, pleasant get out of here, go write the damn script, and, you know, he goes off. I, I was thrilled. And he basically, in, in the course of the story, said, well, you know, we're, you, you've got a script. I think I'd already turned in the first draft, or my draft of the script, which I'd written quickly. And I kind of come up with a great idea. I, I think it's a great script. I wrote it one of my best, I wrote a wonderful script, I think. It was an interesting kind of little fantasy set in, in, in the boondocks of, of Ireland. And uh, in the course of it, he said, well, you know, we can't make them turn into wolves, we're going to have to have wolfhounds. Irish wolfhounds are these kind of weird, you know, they look like best in show dogs that go to show. They're really weird, gangly dogs. The, you know, the point of the wolf is that they're kind of sexual and sensual, and, they're, you know, and there's a lot of sex in this. Like, basically, the gimmick of this movie is it's kind of softcore porn, so you can have some softcore sex scenes in it and stuff, and then you have a fantasy, and then you have a couple sex scenes. You know, that's how Roger Corman made a million of these movies, and he could make, sell them to the drive-ins and so forth. Okay, so... I write the script. I'm perfectly happy with the script. He says, you're going to change them to wolfhounds. And, and, I, and he kept coming up with rational reasons why wolfhounds were more interesting. But what it came down to, and I think Francis told me this, was they're cheaper. Rent, hiring someone to bring trained wolves into a movie set costs a lot of money. But Irish wolfhounds were a dime a dozen, especially in the Isle of Man. I think they made the movies in the Isle of Man. I'm not sure, but I think that's where they were. All right, so this movie goes on. I write it. I send it in. I don't talk to them. Um, and over a couple of years, it actually kind of disappeared. And they gave me another script to do called, called Shakedown, um, which was basically a, a thriller set in, in, a, in Los Angeles during an earthquake. And the premise was this. It was, I think, Roger had gotten a bunch of... Uh, he had gotten got a bunch of... Uh, 
footage of an earthquake. And he decided he was going to make movies about earthquakes because he got this, this footage he'd paid for. It. He would use the same footage over and over again, I guess. So I do the film. They go off and shoot the movie. And then I never hear from them for months and months and months. And then one day, Francis calls me and says something like, could you look at the what we have? Uh, um, she says, oh, the movie's disappeared. We can't find the movie because we shipped it back from Ireland like super cheap. And what showed up in our offices was a bunch of wicker furniture. This is my favorite part of the whole thing. They had set, set it so cheap that a bunch of wicker furniture showed up at the offices in uh, Con New, Concord New Horizons in L.A. or Santa Monica or wherever it was. And she says, we're, we're trying to find out where that shipment was going and that may be where our film is. After months, I guess the movie was in Texas and they had all these film and they had uh, all the, the, the film that had to be finally delivered and they cut together a rough cut and she sent me the rough cut and said, you know, we don't, we're having trouble with this. It doesn't make sense in certain parts. And I said, and I, I watched the movie and I said, there's two problems. One, you have this kind of attractive, kind of inflated, almost rubber woman. She's not, she's not a very sexy woman. I'm sorry. The woman who's, she's, she's a terrible actress. And, and I said, she's really not very good. She's a terrible lead actress for this movie. And I did not know that she was Playmate of the Year. She, that's the only reason they made the movie was because this woman was in it. This is why I never became big in Hollywood as I totally didn't recognize how, how important she was. And the second thing was, is a whole reel of film, like the middle of the movie was missing. So the middle of my script, and they clearly shot it because they had the outer sides, had just disappeared. So there's a whole section, if you, ever, if you ever are so bored you watch this movie, the middle of the movie is actually just missing. It just disappeared. Then there's also, there's the third thing was, there were sex scenes in it that I didn't understand who they were. There's one scene where the guy has two women who aren't even characters in the movie. And I think it's a dream sequence, but it's just a sex scene with this guy and two women. And that's it. And, but other than that, the parts of the movie that are in it are actually my script, and there's some pretty good scenes in it. And it's, It was an interesting total mess, as far as I was concerned. I turned in a really good script for Shakedown, and they threw it all. I think they actually threw it all away, except uh, um, Francis seemed to think that they influ I influenced some of it. But basically, I, did, I don't recognize this movie at all. Anyway, so that's the end of the, that was the end of the story, sort of. Eventually, this movie comes out, and uh, um, I don't remember see, remember it coming out. I don't think anyone watched it. Again, I don't think Roger ever lost money on a movie, so I think he'd sold it to Israeli television and some sort of Swedish drive-ins or something. He always had these weird package deals for the movies. The movie comes out. Um, I don't really think about it much after that. I kind of, I keep in touch with Frances when I could, who I haven't talked to in many years. I hope she's well if she hears this. And never heard anything about um, her after that. And was just kind of kept in touch when I could because I liked her. And she was a very interesting and very smart person. Okay. In 2000, whenever the hell this book came out. 2003, Blake Bailey writes this wonderful biography of Richard Yates. One of my favorite writers. It's a lovely biography. It's very respectful of Yates. It's very honest about the failings of Richard Yates, which were considerable as a, as a person. Serious drinker, serious problems. And in the course of reading this book, I've read a long section near the end, which is about his time with Roger Corman, when he goes to work with Roger Corman on a, something. I think he worked with him on the bridge at Remagen. I'm not entirely, don't quote me on that. But he worked on a kind of upper, you know, Corman did some well, some well-financed Hollywood films. And Yates went to work on one of the more classy versions, unlike, you know, moi. Um, so uh, in this course of this, I find out that not only was he working with Roger Corman, but he had an affair with Francis Dole. That a lo fairly long affair with Francis Dole while he was in Hollywood. Fairly intense one, I could tell, from both of them. And that, to a large extent, the story that I had loved since, you know, I can remember reading in the 80s, Saying Goodbye to Sally, which I'd given in classes and I love, it's one of my favorite stories, was based roughly on this relationship between him and Francis Dole. So there is that long, what have all these things got to do with each other? Here's my, my story as it, as it went through. After, you know, it, when, when, uh, when Richard Yates died in the early 90s, Francis had an interest in what happened to him. I had read the interviews I had done with him 
and the piece, the couple of pieces I did on Richard Yates, she had read me, and somehow that connected to reading my story, Dream of the Wolf, and when I came out, she asked. We had a little conversation. It was kind of interested in Richard Yates and and what had happened. She never mentioned that they knew each other really well, but um, at the same time, none of this would have happened. All of these weird things that happened, this kind of fun trashy, complete mess of a movie um, would have happened except for this kind of long historical love for my personal love for Richard Yates, her personal relationship with Yates, um, the fact that there was this kind of place that allowed let, that allowed decent writers to come work. That was always Corman's, you know, Corman let good writers alone. He brought them in and paid them and got rid of them. Um, and uh, that that was all there. So it's a total set of coincidences. It's completely pointless. You haven't learned anything about literature. It, and, and it's totally meaningless, but it's one of my favorite um, memories of being a writer, of, of, of working on this, this movie. And at a time, I would say that most people, I, I remember telling my students, you know, I'm working for Roger Corman. And they went, yeah, you know, so who cares? But by the time I worked for Corman, he wasn't really trendy or cool anymore like in the 60s and the 70s. Anyway, all these are great books. You should read the Blake Bailey biography. You should read Roger Corman. This is a hilarious book to read in the bathtub. Um, How I Made a Hundred Movies in Hollywood and Never Made Lost a Dime. You should read my book, Dream of the Wolf. This is a great book of stories. Um, this is one of my all-time favorite American collections of stories, Liars in Love. Um, the collected stories of Yates are out there as well, but this is just a great single-author collection. And um, that's it. We'll try, we'll try to save for the next pointless and meaningless uh, um, anecdote, an especially pointless and meaningless one. Okay, take care. Bye.